seven people. This is an extra special treat. We have two NBA players and a beloved member of the uh, police staff here who's got a very good reputation in the community. So great opportunity to talk about some huge issues in society today. Very excited about this. We're bringing back for only the second time ever, we're bringing back guests. Antoine Walker did such a good job last time. We have Officer Larry Wallace here joining us too from Curie. So very, very grateful for you guys joining us. And then we've got one of Nick's all-time number one friends, Melvin Eli, 2002 lottery pick, former teammate of Nick's. And so we're, we're hoping to get some dirt on Nick from uh, Mr. Eli. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, first, I want to I dish it off to Rob because this was kind of Rob's brainchild of an episode. There's huge things going on in society. And today I'm basically going to listen more than anything um, and then just edit the video. So, Rob, I'd love for you to tee up this episode, please. Uh, yeah, first, uh, as always, thank you guys for coming on. Um, that is real important. Um, when, we was th when we came back to do this episode, we tried to go back, and my vision was to go back to the three uh, best guests that we had on at that time that, that we did. And Antoine and um, Larry and, and, and Marcus Liberty were the three best. To, that was the biggest highlights we got from everybody. So we want to recap that with what's going on in society and bring you guys back on to talk about that. And it just happened to be, and it's funny because Larry, your, yours was really good with Coach Thomas, but then I went back at what's going on in society right now, which is kind of funny, which yours be one of the highlights of what, I, what the uh, 13 Rings was really about and how it strapped and, 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 and all those different things. So your episode kind of came right back into play for what's going on in society right now, um, which is for all of us on here, we've all been through those type of things. I mean, Larry, even before you became the police, you, you went through those things, living where you live at and dealing with those situations that we're dealing with now. And, and um, it's, it's big for our communities. And then to have um, Antoine and Melvin on, who are, you know, former NBA players, you know, this could have been a time when they could have been playing and they would have been, you know, possibly trying to make this same stance and, and getting their views of the stance that the NBA players or just professional athletes, period, the stance that they took and the outlooks that, you know, on, on sports um, in that. So I just want to thank you guys for coming. This should be awesome, you know, um, outside of just our basketball minds, period, just us being black men, it, it's huge for us right now, you know, and this, this is a, a chance for us to uh, give our peace and our voice to be heard. It, that, this is very important. So um, I agree. Uh, we, can, we can kick it over. Uh, I really don't, I mean, I'll chime in when it's time, but, you know, it, it, it's, it's tough right now, fellas. It's tough for us as a community. It's tough for us as a, as a race. You know, and, and um, it's time for us to put our foot forward and step forward and not just talking. We have to we have to do more. We have to do yeah, more. Sir. I agree, Rob. And uh, I like to chime in, too, man, uh, from a police perspective. I want to say something, man, that probably needs to be said, and it's not said often enough. I said I think the biggest misperception in the public is that when the police do foolish things and when there's misconduct, from a police officer that all police are going to defend that person. And that's not the case, man. They're so, I mean, when you hear the majority of the police that talk on TV or you hear them in the media uh, giving, giving interviews, you hear a small minority of you know, opinions because the police officers that I talk to and generally don't agree with a lot of the things that are happening in the world and as far as the, as far as the crimes against our people, and, I, and I'm gonna go ahead and call them crimes against our people because that's exactly what they are. Nobody agrees with that. You know, we all see those things for what they are, and we all agree that those things are being done um, for a whole multitude of reasons. And the biggest reason, like I think I mentioned on the last podcast when I was on with you guys, I said a lot of these things are happening out of fear. These these um, non-African-American and you know, non-brown, not non-black and brown police officers that are patrolling our communities are not accustomed to dealing with our people and they overreact a lot of times. And, uh, and I said it before, I think a lot of the times it's out of fear. And um, rather than 
understanding what they're dealing with too often time you know too often the first reaction is to pull their weapon and and 90 percent of the time that's the wrong reaction to those situations because i think the thing i know the thing in kenosha should have been handled differently and that kind of supports what i'm saying as far as those officers should have posted those weapons a long time ago and sometimes you got to fight and that's just the reality of the job i mean it's it's not a a great situation to have to be in but that's what we signed up for and every combative person you come in contact with does not warrant you shooting them and that's what we're seeing too often you know sometimes you got to take some and, and and i go out of the limb and say sometimes you go take an ass whooping and you and sometimes you know that's just the nature of the job you know and if you know sometimes you're gonna win sometimes you're gonna lose it's when they fight you know it ain't no fight 100 percent guaranteed you're gonna win and that's what they're afraid of. They're afraid of losing a fight and they pull the weapons, man. And then it takes it to a whole nother level that they don't have to go to. So unfortunately, man, you know, like I say, I, I feel for the situation in, in Kenosha. I feel for that guy's family. You know, they, they want to keep bringing up his criminal background, but I think that that's a moot point. When you look at the totality, you know, I don't care what he's done criminally in his past. You can't be judge and jury on the street. You know, you can't shoot that guy in the back seven times and and tell me this that that's justifiable it's just not i just can't see it and i mean there's other ways that should there's other ways that could have been handled you know i hate to pay monday morning quarterback to any police officer situation but as i keep looking at it man it just doesn't sit well with me it just i just can't i just can't look at that and say you know i can't find any positives in that situation it just didn't look like it went the right way and, and the outcome definitely proved that it didn't go the right way because that should have been handled differently that guy could have been dealt with, you know, they knew who he was. His 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 background at that location was well known. It was documented that he had been involved in a relationship with the lady at that address. Had he gotten to the car and drove off, if you another warrant, anything, you could have done that a lot of different ways. So it's unfortunate that, it, that they handled it the way they handled it because it, it just shit, it gave another black eye to the police, which we don't need any more black eyes. And, uh, put us in a position where we you know somebody's got to do something you know if it's training if it's you know trying to get some of these guys retrained and and up to speed as far as dealing with you know black and brown communities that that's gonna have to happen you know i've been seeing it for 29 years and i'm at the end of my rope but i don't know what you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at the end of my road i should say and i don't know where we go from here from a police standpoint other than better training better training you know they still defund instead of defunding the police department they need to to, to add funding to, to try to help better train some police officers you know so i don't know if that could be a, a defund situation it should be more money allocated to get these guys better trained is my opinion Man, that, um, that's actually what i was going to want to ask you um just for my part um and seeing everything that's going on one thing that's bothered me, um, obviously we see the crimes that are happening of George Floyd and then obviously to Jacob and, you know, it's heart wrenching and we all, you know, we all feel and, you know, it makes us really upset. Um, the one thing that's bothered me is that I'm not a community activist. That's not something that I've done in my life, but it's no one, when I see us looting and, and riding and going out and burning stuff up and, breaking in stores and doing those things, that, that's not the answer. Not um, at all. I wish, I wish there was someone, um, you know, like yourself or a community activist and just everybody that we could sit down and come up with maybe four or five things that we could possibly change to kind of even the playing field, if you want to say. Because obviously our reaction is when the officers do not get arrested, um, it makes us mad. Um, right. When they just get get put on leave and they're they're allowed to go home to their families, and where if there's another person, especially a black man that had killed, it's a bad, or shot it's somebody, a bad yeah, you're gonna arrest them right away, and I think that's where the anger comes out with people, and I look at what the NBA players did and taking a stance, and it was a small stance. I understand what they was doing, but um, yesterday they announced that they wanted three things, and that's the only thing I was worried about. I, missing games is nothing. But to be able to ask for a couple more things and things that we want to see change, 
I thought was huge. And that's what it's all about. Um, I think whether it's, you know, it's the NBA, we got to continue to try to press the envelope to come up with creative ideas. And I think it is training. I think we have to, you have to train white officers how to handle hostile situations um, in, black, in black communities without having to go to their guns. And I don't know who, you know, I don't know who's in charge of that or who we can do that, but that's something that needs to happen. I think obviously police need to be held accountable immediately at some point. We got to figure out a way to hold the police accountable uh, when they do something wrong. Because I don't think it's all bad police officers, but the ones that we're seeing these isolated events, they need to be held accountable. And it's sad that we don't see that when you see a Breonna Taylor situation where nobody's been held accountable. Um, so those things, that's what's upsetting people. But I think it has to be a list. You know, I think we have to figure out a better way as, as black people. It's not by looting and burning down. We're not going to get the answers we want that way. We're going to have to figure out four or five things. And I, and I don't have all those answers. I was, you know, I could always brainstorm and think of things that can be creative to, that we need to change. But it does have to start with training. And then the accountability the, of officers um, getting held account accountable is going gonna, is gonna to be the big thing for us. So from my side of it, that's why I look at it. I know you know, I can never be on the side that you sit on and, and understand what you go through every day. You got a family you come home to and put you guys in hostile positions. So I do understand that. But we got to figure out a way. And I don't, I don't know if you can speak on that. If there's any way possible, you know, we got to figure out a way to, to see how we can change the laws to get the training back. Because obviously they cannot handle hostile situations. Before anybody else speak, Twan, you hit something that's, that I was talking to somebody about uh, about two weeks ago. We don't have a voice. We don't have that activist for us like we did before. And, and it, I mean, in a Martin Luther King and, and people like, we don't, we don't have that right now in our society, period. You know, where people are gonna rally behind this one person who has the bagging of everybody. You know, you got a person here talking, you got a person here talking, but we don't have that activist that we had back in the days when our parents were, you know, coming up, they had an activist who they followed behind. We don't have that right now. And that's, that's kind of, um, I think, disheartening for us because we don't have nobody to rally behind, you know? And, yeah. and then, start, like you said, the looting, we start rallying behind the wrong people. Yeah. To do those type of things, you know? Yeah. Oh, charlatans as well. The ones that, that <laughs> speak and, and say they're speaking for us that really don't. So, right. Mm -hmm. The young one that they kind of stuck. Yeah. Because no, I mean, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. They, a lot of their views are a little different than ours, especially because we're older. You know, um, I, I was just talking to a guy, a young man the other day about what's going on, and he like, you know, he understand it, but he don't. You know, and, and, and it, everything was like kind of okay with him. And I'm like, it's not okay to, to wake up and, and see the news and, and it's 57 people shot in our city and, and 10 of them died. That, that's not okay. You know what I'm saying? And, <laughs> yeah, that's not, that's not okay at all. That's, that to them is okay. That's that's the norm, but that's not normal. We we have to get away from them thinking that these things are normal. So they, you know, and and I, I my biggest thing, and I'm a, I'm gonna end it on my part on this is the last situation that we had here in Chicago. That was just an opportunist. Those people opportunists. They did that because they saw opportunity. They know they really didn't have no clue about what happened. They didn't know what was going on with the young man who was shot by the police. Absolutely. They did it. This is what we can do. Let's go do it. They can't stop that's, us. And that's what we got to separate, man. We got to separate. Rob, you hit it on the head. You got. We have to separate activists from criminals. Right. Because uh, you have a lot of people out here pretending to be activists and spearheading the looting. And like you say, for opportunities. It's not for anything. They could care less about any of, the, any of the incidents that are taking place, they just see an opportunity to go out here and commit crimes. Yeah. That has, it, there has to be a separation in that. On the other side, no, no one, there's no one in the world can tell me anything about being poor and not having stuff. Right. There's nobody can tell me that. Right. They can, I don't know about some other people, but nobody can tell me anything about being poor because I was poor. I know what that feels like not to have anything, right. but my mother was not going to let me go not somebody upside the head or kick in somebody's door or go rob something to get something. That's just not what she was going to let me do. So you can't tell, I, my lights wasn't on. Our gas wasn't, we, I, I know all of that. I know sharing shoes. I know sharing pain. I know how that feels. I know all of that. So nobody can tell me it's because we don't have anything. I know how that feels. I know how it feels not to have anything, but it wasn't, it wasn't for me to go 
robbing or, you know, I live right by some train tracks. They stopped all the time. If I dare went up to the train tracks, my mother was going to kill me when I got home. And when I brought the stuff home, she's going to say, take it back up there. And I hope the police get it. <laughs> you know, that's what it is. Rob, that's what it is now. Yeah. That's but let, let me, let me, Those mothers. Are, uh, yeah. let, let, let me chime in because clearly this is something that I actually thought about. I talked about it. And I talk about it all the time. I talk about it all the time. I'm going to go back to what Larry said. At the very beginning of this whole thing, the police... I, I, I've been struggling with this whole thing and said, oh, they're racist, they're racist. I don't even know if they're racist. A lot of these guys are just petrified, just scared, yes. absolutely scared. That I think when you look at it, when you look at their actions, their actions are not even actions of a guy that's racist a lot of times. They are guys that are scared. Now, that doesn't mean that some of them are not racist because I'm not saying that. But when you look at how a police officer, a white police officer interacts with a white uh, suspect, a detainee, it's always different. It's always different. Whether or not they are a murderer, whether or whatever, it's always different. Why? Because that they look like them and they think that they can deal with them. When they deal with us, it's always different. I'll tell you this. Um, my, I come from a family of police officers. So when I hear the people talk about defund police, get rid of police, as much as I despise the racist and the bad policemen, I still need to call somebody when, when something happens in my life. And Jilly is going to be a policeman I'm going to call. Okay, I'm not going to call a counselor. I'm not calling a counselor when someone breaks in a house or, or does something or has an act. I'm going to call a policeman. But I, I think you all, and, and, we, and let, let's be honest, guys, no matter how much training we give these guys, if you are a racist, it's a part of your DNA. You're not going to train it away. You're just not going to train it away. I mean, we can try. We can definitely try because think about it like this, and this is what I tell people all the time. The difference with police and fire, and, and all of us that grew up in Chicago and the Chicago area, we know that the, the, the Chicago Police Department is right with racists. They have been that way for 100 years. This is not a new thing with Chicago. But think about the fire department. The same people that have pictures and whatever else going on about black people, monkeys, whatever they call them, whenever you call the fire department to your house because your house is on fire, they are going in your house. They're not going to sit outside and say, this is a poor black man's house. They're going inside of the house. So therefore, you look at these police, they, every day they go to crime scenes where they're black people that have been shot or, or people that have been injured. They always attempt to assist them. We can't say the same thing with the police. When, when black people, by and large, come in contact with police, it's always a 50-50 it's a whether it's going to be a good or bad um, encounter. I would tell you this, when you look at the Chicago Police Department, and now I think by and large, all police are, are riding with partners. And if you look at partners, and Larry probably can speak more to this than I can, but I'm just doing based on my observation, most of our police are either all black or all white. There's no counterbalance in that car. There's no counterbalance in our communities with a black cop, with a white cop. So that hopefully when you get to a situation when you're fearful, the black cop can probably kind of step in and say, hold on, let me handle this. Or let's do it like this versus two white policemen who are both scared, who they go from one to 10 immediately, one to 10 immediately. And to the young people that are looting, granted, I am clearly not for looting and all of the other things. I grew up in the 70s and the 80s. And what I can tell you, when we look at young people today, the things that they see are far greater than anything that uh, a lot of us on here ever saw because killing of black boys has been going on forever, okay? The difference is now it comes, to, it comes in our living room. It comes in our living room, it comes on our Twitter feeds, it comes on our social media handles. So young people today, they keep seeing it. I mean, and, and granted, it's one, two, maybe three, and we make, and I'm not trying to trivialize it, but they keep seeing the same thing every, 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 every. That's a problem. And so a lot of these young people are lashing out. And God knows I don't agree with how they lash out, but they're lashing out. Now, like you all talked about it, we look at those opportunists. The opportunists are the worst, man. They are the absolute worst. We talk about no one to really follow. Let's look in the streets today when we lock up all of our uh, leaders of our gangs. What happened when all of the leaders of the gangs went to prison? It just broke off. And we had a million different gangs. We had everybody wow, following everybody. There was yep. nobody that had, and mind you, 
the suggestion that, man, we need gang leaders, where that, that sounds novel to white America. But in the black community, when there was a problem, you could get to the gang leader and he could say, you know what, we're going to solve this problem. We're not going to kill babies anymore. We're not going to kill random people anymore. But now it's a free-for-all. And, and it's the same thing that's going on with these young people in the streets. Right now, they're just, everybody is making up their own rules to the game as they go. Um, we have a major problem in this country. Uh, policing is one of them and is not the only one of them. You know, there are a lot of other problems. And, and we, have to, we have to do a better job of educating our young people that are with us, or those of us that coach, clearly. We have to make sure they understand that all police are not bad. All police are not bad. I believe that the police have a part to play also. You know who your bad partner is. You know the guy that's writing bad paper. You know when he writes that paperwork up, all the stuff he put on that paper is a lie. You know it's a lie. Look at Laquan McDonald. Those people were lying other than it being on videotape. We would probably, uh, th that policeman would be out on the streets today. Bad policemen, good policemen, you know, they say a good guy with a gun stops a bad guy with a gun. Well, good police, they can help us get rid of bad policemen. That's the way I feel. That's the way I look at it. And I think what happens in the police department more so more times than not, Tyrone, I think what happens in the police department, like if you identify a guy as probably being sketchy, police officer wise, you avoid him rather than, rather than, you know, I mean, it's been, it's been over the years, you see a guy say, I don't know about that dude, I'm gonna stay away from him. And you make sure the people in charge don't put me in a car with that guy right there. So you just avoid him. Yeah, but Larry, but, that, but you can't avoid him. See, you, you know that this guy is a cancer. You know it. You know it. That's why you don't want to be around him. So yeah. th 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 there has to be a mechanism in the system. And I'm not saying you got to walk into the commander and say, hey, uh, get rid of Nick. He's a bad cop. No, maybe it has to be uh, anonymous. I don't know what it is. But at the end of the day, we can't know that these bad people keep going into our communities, uh, inflicting pain on our people. And, oh, and, our answer is, and our answer is, I'm just going to stay away from him. I, I, you know, that, that, that kind of shouldn't be the way it goes. I mean, because if it doesn't, and you think about it, the good policemen are being victimized now by society because of the role of the bad policemen. The oh, bad absolutely. policemen are making it bad for all of those of you that are good. Every police absolutely. officer now, when they leave work, they got to watch their back for fear that people are going to do something to them. And they've done nothing but try to do good. Nothing but try to do good. So now they get, they get just like the bad black people that America sees and they, they, they label every black person as bad. The same way the police, the bad police see black people, black people are now seeing all police the same way. And, and both, both groups are not the same. We have to be able to differentiate between good and bad in both classes. And right now we're not doing that. And we're not doing that. And it's hurting us. And we're, we're dying at the hands of the people that are charged with, with, with the ability to keep us safe. And that's just not good. No, I agree. And, and the thing I, I, I'll be mad about, Larry, maybe you can help me understand this, is every time, you know, a white officer or whatever, you know, you know, kill a black guy or, you know, shoot a black guy or whatever, they always try to go to their background. Oh, they did this. They did this. It's no justifying putting a knee on a person's neck and, and killing them. It's no justifying shooting a, 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 a black guy seven times. It's, it's no justifying that. You know, I understand, you know, it, wrong is wrong and right is right. I understand that. But, you know, you doing that and, and, and killing these these people, and then you try to, oh, well, they did this, they did that. Okay, but it, that don't give you right to kill them, though. That don't right. give you right. You know, you know so, I, touch, I agree. I touched on that earlier, Nick. I think, you know, I think with that, that kind of goes back to trying to assassinate the person's character to justify yeah. What happened, and that, and I think that's that's a practice that's been happening, you know, since the history of time, since the history of the police department, of all police departments, and I think it's wrong. I agree because that, like I said earlier, it has nothing to do with what what's happening today, what's happening right now at this moment. What this guy did, the uh, last week, last month, last year, has nothing to do with what I. You know, I can only deal with him based off what is happening in front of me right now. You know, so that should not come in, that should not affect or it sh should be missing what his background is because it has no bearing on the outcome of what is happening today with this person. And we it's can't all, use that as all use. All, all use the president's the, the, the situation. And, and, and if he were, if he had done some other things that were wrong, fine. Once we get him in custody for a bit, <laughs> Then we can then deal with whatever. Then we can help the other yeah. Exactly. But, but, but 
But we, because all of us have done some things that we wouldn't be proud of. I mean, and the police don't pull me over for a traffic ticket and say, oh, well, you didn't pay your taxes. Oh, you didn't do that. No, they get me for a traffic ticket. And then if that right. other stuff should come up, then they deal with it accordingly. I think it, it, it's just so much. I, I mean, Larry, I, I know as a policeman, it has got to be, it's got to be tough. It's got to be tough. It's got to be tough. I mean, what once in a black community, something that used to be a, um, a, 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 a great profession that you can perform and you can afford a great life for you and your family. A lot of black police are now, and like I said, I've got family members and I don't want to go into it, but they oftentimes as black policemen question whether or not this is the thing they should keep on doing. And not because of, not because of anything that they've done. It's nothing that they've right. done. And, and, right. and, 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 and it's unfair because I tell all young black people, every young black person that I know, I say, you need to be running down there and sign up to become a Chicago policeman. It's a lifelong job. It's a lifelong job. And, and you have an opportunity to help people and to move up and to do great things. And, and we got some people that, have, and I'm tired of the spoiled uh, apple in the bunch because we all know what happens when you get one bad apple in the bunch. It screws up the rest of the apples in the bunch. And that's what's <laughs> yeah. going on right now. I guess I'm taking Gordon, I guess I'm taking Gordon to spot for the day. So this, this is for uh, Melvin and Twan. What, what um, Twan, I think you touched on it a little bit. But what, what's your take on what, what happened with the athletes? Not just, not just um, the NBA people, but baseball, football, everybody who, you, who took the stands. What, what's your take on, on that? And, and, and if you were still playing at that time, what would be your take? Um, I can go first. I, well, for me, I thought it was good. Um, I, thought be, I wish it would have been a little more organized. Um, because what ended up happening is you make a, a, a quick reaction like that and then have a, a end result could have almost burnt those guys. And obviously, luckily, they was able to get into some meetings and, and get some expertise. Um, I think, especially for the NBA, um, once you decided to go into the bubble, um, you kind of made your decision that we're going we're gonna to use our platform at this bubble to, to fight social injustice and I thought that the league did a great job with the Black Lives Matter on the floor, giving players opportunity um, to use different names um, on the back of their jersey. Obviously, the, the platform to speak whenever they want to about, um, about social injustice. So I thought they, they did a great job. Um, it seemed like the NBA is, is kind of just spearheaded, it, you know, obviously with the other sports getting involved. Um, but I thought it was great. Um, I thought they did a good job of making the stands, but I felt like if it was more organized, um, you probably could have got a lot more out of it. I know there's a couple of things that they decided, which I think is great. Um, I think I see Ty got that vote on his thing, and I think the players, you know, kind of have taken that initiative too as well when you sit thick and they now making all the NBA arenas have um, – I don't know if you guys saw that. Yeah, so I saw that. One of the things the players are getting – it's every NBA arena will be a, a voting spot now. So I think that's huge um, to be able to get that and get the owners to bag that um, with, with, with obviously what happened with the, with the post office situation. So um, it could have been three, four more quality things that they could have got because they had that type of leverage. Um, you know, I think the Bucks, what they did, maybe because it was in Wisconsin, they felt like they need to do something and they acted on their own. And I think people kind of saw the, the separation a little bit you know, with the league. But it was just more that those guys wanted to do something. But with the league, you could, if you go together and stand together as one, you can get a lot more done. So I, that's the only part I wish they would have done because I've read the comments, I've seen all the interviews, and you could tell they had a little – they had some problems in-house um, because everybody wasn't on the same page. Um, if I was playing, um, I would be down for whatever is going to be best for um, social injustice, but also – what's best for the guys in the league. And I'm, I know a lot of guys, people don't want to talk about this right now, but Rob and, and Melvin can probably allude to this too. Um, it's the economic side to this thing too. Yes. Um, you know, and people got to understand that this is guys' livelihoods. This is how they feed their family. Um, they're in the middle of their season. Some guys get paid over a 12 month period. So guys haven't completely got paid out for this season already. They're still missing six and seven paychecks before they completely paid out. Um, so it, it's, it's tough on them to just tell them to miss work. So people got to understand that was huge for them 
to take that that chance because you don't know how the league could react on you in that situation. So that part is a big part of it. Everybody's not LeBron James that probably has mm-hmm. 30, 40 million in the bank. We got guys, Rob, that play in your program that are not making huge, huge money. Taylor, Kedrick Nunn, those guys, you know, you ask those guys to make a huge sacrifice that's trying to take care of their family um, or what they have. So you got to put that in perspective. A lot of people got to understand that. That's why probably one of the reasons why they had to go back to work. You got to think about everybody. It ain't just, you know, you got to think about all 450 ball players. So um, that would have been a touchy, that would have been a touchy thing. But I think I would have been on, on the side of whatever the players wanted to do and felt like we, if we could make a difference, um, I would have been on that side. And Melvin, you can take it from there because I'm what, you understand you know, that. I got too. one thing that Twan and, and Melvin, this is, and you got Melvin, you could touch on this too as well, and and, and part of this, um, watching uh, TNT and listening to Kenny Smith, he said something that that was real huge to me when George Hill was speaking. He said, "Had they not been in the bubble, we probably would not have ever heard George Hill's opinion about this." because they would have been talking to just the stars. You know, they wouldn't have went to, in the bubble, it's not as many players, it's not as many people. So they're talking to everybody right now. So he said he, he's happy that they're there because he had a chance to hear George Hill's voice. So, right. like the, you, I mean, I guess you guys know, you've been in the locker room. Uh, they, they're, they're spearheading LeBron and AD, you know, and on that team, it probably was the Greek freak and some people. He wouldn't have got that opportunity had he not been in the bubble. So is that correct, Melvin? Like, oh, what up? <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> definitely correct. Uh, you know, when, as a player, when you go in that locker room, uh, hell, I could have clocked 30 minutes. Um, I still know when I go in, they're going to talk to Melo, they're going to talk to Johnson, I get to walk right out that door, you know, and see my family. But I do think that's the good thing with this bubble. Um, it gives people the opportunity to voice their opinion. Um, I love the fact that they made everybody stop. Um, when they stopped uh, playing, um, I think it was to show the world, like, you're not going to sweep this under the rug. rug. You're going to learn this name. You're not going to use this as a getaway from reality. You're going you're gonna to face it. So by making them face it, um, stopping it, because they didn't know financially, they didn't know what was going to happen. You know, they didn't know the fine that they were going to take. And it could have been huge. It could have been small. Um, and they didn't care. And uh, that, was, that was a beautiful part on them. Um, I do have a, a question for Larry, though. And I, I hate to always put him on the hot seat. But I was always wondering, like, when I was little, we had police officers. And we knew their names. Officer Wells, Officer Patterson. Good or bad, we always knew them. Um, I've seen instances of of uh, people getting in trouble at the park and the police officer will go get your mom or just alert her that you were acting a plum nut at the park. Like this, and I lived in Harvey. You know, it, it, this is no, I live in Beverly Hills. Yeah. Is, true true uh, fact, uh, Harvey, baby. <laughs> this is somewhere like when Nick father used to come get me, it was in the morning and I got dropped off in the morning. Like if he had to come at night, he wasn't coming. So I grew up in, not in a nice neighborhood but we knew our officers' names before they pulled that gun out. Like I've heard officers, you know, hey, think of your mom, think of your kids, start naming their kids off. So whatever happened to that type of policing, to where communities actually knew their police officers? Like where did that go? That's missing. That's definitely missing. Because when I, you know, I came on the job in '91, and I remember it being similar to that in every that I worked as a rookie. You know, getting to know people, and I think what's happening now is you they bounce you around so often that you don't have enough time in one location to get to know the people in the way that I used to. I used to know everybody on my beat. I used to know all the I knew all the knuckleheads. I knew all the the older like all the senior seniors that that, that would uh, walk their dogs or uh, go get the newspaper. I would always see them, speak to them, and they would always you know tell me the same thing: be safe. I see you tomorrow. You know, those things are missing because I think times have changed with these new police strategies that, this, they, that they've implemented. You don't have officers in the same locations the way we used to back in the day. And and I think it's because of uh, not, I think there's, I mean, when I joined the department, there was over 18,000 police in Chicago. Now I think we have probably 15,000. That's probably counting detectives. And the numbers aren't the same, and I think so. Therefore, the policing isn't the same. 
Because I, yeah. I mean, there were a few times where I knew I knew guys should have been shot. Like I outright knew that cop should have shot him. But he, you can see a pause in his voice. I mean, literally sitting on my porch, cops got guns out. And you can see him hesitate, not want to do it because they knew that man's name. They not only did they know that man's name, they knew that man's mother. They probably went to school with one of his brothers. That makes and, a difference. And I think if if that cop knew anything about that young man before he pulled that trigger, he would have hesitated. And I think police has, has to come back. You know, there's nothing point. wrong with knowing a police officer's name. And I'm not gonna lie to you, we knew the the when when they got rough with certain people, they was rough with the, with the people on the corner. But I wasn't on the corner. I was sitting on my front yard, too scared to leave the front because my mom was gonna beat my ass. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, make laugh, yeah. but you know that that type of police, I think, is kind of missing out because it, it shows that you're human. Um, even if that's what we got to get back to, man. That's what we got to get back to. That's that's the that's the disconnect that I talk about all the time. That's what we got to get back to. We got to get back to that connection because right now that that is what's broken. That's where we, you know, and it's a and, and that's a great point. Everything you just said is a great point, and all that stuff leads to us being in the predicament that we're in now as a as a police department as far as relationships with the community all those things are playing a huge part because we don't have those relationships with with, with the i mean and you're still going to have to lock people up but if you know the, but but if you get a relationship with the with the good people with the people who who want to say hello when someone gets shot when a kid gets shot those people will reach out to you and give you the information that everybody is afraid to get a police that's why people get away with, you know, shooting kids and it takes so long to arrest somebody who's shooting down the block, accidentally shooting, shooting the wrong person, shooting that, you know, I mean, that's why these things get hard, these crimes are hard to clear up because you don't have that connection with the community to get these conversations going and to get these phone calls when we need them. And I, I would, I would just add this, my last part to, to all this. Um, and I want to go back to the voting part. Over the last, like, I would say the last year for me personally, I don't know how everybody else was. I really didn't know how the cities work and the governments work. I really didn't pay attention. You know, you knew the people that was in power. You knew who the president was. You knew who the mayor was. Um, but I would encourage people that, that listen to this to understand how important it is to vote. And I'm not just talking about President Trump, and I know everybody wants Trump out of office. I'm talking about for your aldermen, for your local judges, for yeah. this is when the this is when the community has to understand. And I and I'll be the first one to admit that I, I didn't know about this, but through the pandemic and being sitting in the house and you realize like who's in charge when you was talking about who you gotta wear a mask in this city, what phase you go in, it's up to the governor, it's up to the mayor. And just learning the separations of the rules that these people that are, that are empowered um have. And we have to do a better job of voting the right people in office. That's another reason why the communities are down. And because the, some of the aldermen don't take control of their, of their communities and make sure certain things go right and stay yeah. on top of things. But that's our fault as people because we voted these people into office. Without or didn't really, vote. You know, or didn't vote. So yeah, it's really true. important. So when I see Ty put vote up there, I really, I'm not, I'll be, like I said, I'll be the first to admit I never was, was big on it. But over the last year, just learning and finally figuring out um, who's empowerment and the process that you got to go through, that vote is important. So anybody that's listening, encourage to make sure you vote, man. Get out there and vote and try to put the right people in place. And I'm telling you, because it will change the community uh, a lot. Um, we get the right ottomans in the right spot. Um, even with our mayor and superintendent, all of it, if you feel like those people are not good, you know, make sure you try to vote and put the right person in there. Man, you touched it. You touched right on it, cause you know, cause I always thought like, okay, we get the good president in, the right president, and we get, we got the house in it. No, you got man, you you got to put the right people in charge, so we could you know make strides in life and 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 pull everything together. But if we just just voting and thinking about it's just about the president, we all wrong. We all wrong about that. But that's I mean, Twan and Nick, them good points and. So you might be able to chime in or anybody else, and especially you, Larry. And, and the problem that we, I know that we have is like when it's time to vote and you look at that thing and it say judges, you don't even know who the judges are. Right. So <laughs> That's vote. a good point. 
You know, right. you just go no, up you know. your name and you just <laughs> vote. You don't know right. who the judges hey. are or anything. So hey, I'm guilty of that, man. We probably need to be educated <laughs> on that. That discourages a lot of people from voting, Rob. Right? Say it again. That stuff like that discourages a lot of people from voting, too, man. They go in there, they go into the voting booth and they feel overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. yes. So you know what? Yeah. One of the things I'll say back to something that Antoine had talked about with the players, and, and this is really, really important because those guys, at least the, the high end guys, they have massive abilities to move people with not just their words, but with their money and with their their sponsors' money. The the question for me really becomes: Great first step. What's next? What are we going to do next when you're out of the bubble? Are you going to go back to your beautiful homes and your phenomenally gated communities and be comfortable and love your family, which is okay if right. that's what you choose to do? Or are you going to get together and do just what we just talked about? Put your resources, your name, your energies behind uh, informing and educating communities about who the judges are, why you need to vote for this person or versus that person. I can't think of what the young lady's name is that was in the WNBA. When we look at what she did, she stopped playing last year to help get that young man out of prison. Maya Moore. Maya Moore, yeah. Maya Moore. She forfeited playing basketball, what she loved, to do something that, was, that she had conviction in. It wasn't just talking about it. She yeah. gave up something to do it, kind of like what Jesus told the disciples. You know, the disciples said, we want to follow you. And Jesus told the disciples, <laughs> Uh, people, I hate you if you follow me. At some point, as NBA players, and, and again, I can't tell anybody what to do with their money. I would never do that. But what I can say is you can't talk about the injustices that you see and talk about your people, but yet you move into communities that nobody in that community looks like you. They don't even want you in the community if you were not rich. So then you have an opportunity to go back into your own community. I'm not saying you have to live there. I don't tell anybody where to live or where to spend their money. But we have to do more once we come out of the bubble than we did while we were in the bubble. And a part of that, I think, is educating people, not just on the thought of voting, but how to informatively vote and who it is that we need to vote for. When we look at it right now, you look at the, the, the Republican Senate. They have approved over 200 conservative judges that will be in position for, for, for life. So black people, you may get charged in Chicago and your case goes through the court system and you will get railroaded all the way to prison by bad judges, by bad judges. That is fundamentally important to what we need and what we do. And we as a community, we need to educate ourselves yeah. and those of us that know more, we need to educate others and players. If you really want to make an impact, and I believe that they can, and I genuinely believe they want to, when you leave the bubble, don't go back to your neighborhood that you're in now. Go back to the neighborhood that you were from before and help educate those people. Like Melvin, go back to uh, Harvey if you really love Harvey. Go back to the west side of Chicago if you really love the west side of Chicago. These athletes, they can move mountains. They can move mountains. When people see them, people want to be with them. All we have to do is do the right thing. And I think that's our, our big challenge. What's our next step? We know what the first step was. What's the next step? And we, have, and we have time to get this right, but we have to work at it. We have to really, really work at it. And I believe that we can. Yeah, you got to have you, you gotta have a plan. A uh, plan. They, yeah, you, we got to have a good plan because, I mean, everybody's speaking up. I think somebody touched on it uh, about the activists and, and uh, this and that. Who was our activist? Who was our Martin Luther King? You know, that's one, you, you know, that's one thing we have to look at. And, and somebody got to step up and be that for us. And, hey, Ty. Right. Hey, Ty, you know what's crazy? I was going to say, it's just funny, though. But you show sure right. That's why I'm so glad they decided to play. Because if they didn't play, I'm going to keep it 100. Them boys just hit yeah. the Cancun. Yeah. They the Cancun, the Ruba. <laughs> Them boys just hit all over the world. Oh, uh, they were going to do it. They were about to go party, hey, boy. Hey, Mel, Mel know that. They weren't headed to Kenosha, Wisconsin. They was uh, no. <laughs> and, 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 and we as a community, we have an obligation now to hold them accountable. You got yes. all these people to support you and, and got behind you. And when you leave the bubble, like you say, you headed to Cancun. Well, what the hell? Cancun <laughs> with uh, uh, Kenosha burning right now. And you were talking, and again, if you don't, it, what's that old saying? Uh, don't talk about it. What? Be about it. Be about it. Be about it. Be about it. It's time to be about it now. Don't, don't grandstand. Don't grandstand. Hey, Go ahead hey. and do it. And you, and you will That's be well awesome. respected and you will be loved because of doing hey, it. Think about it. Colin Kaepernick, four years ago, they thought he was a damn fool. 
P is the most profound guy going out there. Now. Everybody, yeah, yeah. Everybody. yeah, they did. My, hey. Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali, when he wouldn't go and fight the uh, the the, the, v, the Vietnamese, we thought he was crazy. When he died, he was revered. All of these people that they hated when they took when they took uncomfortable positions against uh, what they perceived to be injustices, people hated them when they did it. But after they do it, they people will love you. Why? Because they come to the realization. I might have been too scared to take that stand when you did. And that's hey, who, all it's about. Who, who backed uh, Colin Kaepernick? Who backed him? Just do nope. it, baby. Go ahead, Nike. You're right. Go ahead, go right. ahead, Ty. Okay. Nike, right now, we, it, we, we, I'm not going to put you on that. I'm not going to put you on the hot seat for that one. But okay, you're right. You're right. <laughs> but, but like, it's funny, Ty, it's funny you say that. And, and Larry and, uh, and Nick, y'all can attest to this. Uh, that's sort of like what we do when we, when we coaching. Yeah. It, it's like, who going to step out there first? And then, you know, you get certain people step out there and then you don't see them no more. The, the, the people who said they're going to go, which, I mean, it's, it's a plain example of when me and Ty was like, and, and Mike, and he's not on here, why they keep putting us in the same section or to go down state? To, why they keep doing that? So we came up saying, we ain't going, we're not going to vote. The vote not going to hurt anybody. We're not going to vote for sectional. It's not going to hurt anybody. You're still going to be able to participate. Just don't log in and vote. Oh. Me and Ty went on a thing. People voted anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that, well, now, but, 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 hey, the, the thing, a, but the thing, well, but hold on, Nick. But the thing you have to tell about that, those same people said that they were with us. They yeah. They were with us when we said we're not going to vote. And then we go online and we look. And those people have voted. And that's the same thing that happens in our community. That's why we can't have anything substantive. Because everybody, they, they mad about the shooting. They mad about the this. They mad about the that. We marching. We going. You look up for the march. Hell, it's two people. I thought we had a movement. <laughs> two people is not a movement. Because I, a remember, movement. I remember, Clay, I think Larry, I think either you or Mike called me and said, y'all sure y'all not voting? And I said, no, nah, we not voting. And, I, and one of y'all said, OK, well, we're not going to vote either. No. And then me and Ty go on there and look, it's people who, we was in a meeting. We lead a meeting, we got it, we good. We gonna hey, 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 Smitty, at the end of the day, it's only, it was only a few people gonna speak up anyway. But that's, you know what, what I'm that, that is kind of what and we're we on this, on. And we on this uh, platform right now. <laughs> but, you, but you know what the funny part is? And it's the same thing I said about the players. You know, and, and, and Melvin and Antoine, you guys were big dogs in this game at one point. You go into a tough game, you go into a tough game, you know some guys behind you are scared tonight. That's all right. I know y'all scared. But the big dogs say, don't worry about it. I, I'm here. I'm here. The big dogs say, I'm here. That's what we need the players to do. They're the big dogs. Tell the people, we here. We got you. Don't worry about it. We will follow you if you lead us the right way. The problem yeah. is you can't you can't be in the bubble talking big and then in Cancun hey. riding on big jet skis. That, that don't do it for us. That don't do it for us. What happens if you do speak up and then they treat you like Colin Kaepernick? Didn't know yeah. football players come back him up. Uh, and that, that's the same. By him. That's now he's right. He's right yeah. now. But that's what, four years without a job and that young man is still in playing condition? Mm -hmm. yep. Right. But, 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 and, you know, the other thing I said about that is, is right now, but the way things are going and the way society is right now, if people speak up now, it's it's, it's going to be hard for people to do them like they did Kaepernick. It's just going to be really yeah. hard. No, they're, no, they're, they're not going to do LeBron they're, they're James they, like that. They'll, they'll, they'll change right. the hurting of okay. something. I get you. I get you. Oh, he, oh, you know, they would have kept him when he, when he, you know, twists his ankle. But, you know, let's get him out. Nobody right. pick him up. Now he's out because he's, he's injured. Not right, because okay. he woke up at some injustice because some some poor man got his head slammed to the concrete or somebody got shot seven times in the back. Like, no. And it, it's a it's something that can't happen. Like if you speak up too loud, they will hit your check. That's okay. gonna happen. That's a fact. That's that's, 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 that's the... we have to we have to be organized so that when they hit our check, oh we know what a we know what a check hit looks like. We know what it looks like. There's a whole list of those guys out there. When they hit our check, then we have to be prepared to hit their check. That's the one thing that I keep talking about in this whole thing. America does not give a damn about black or white. They are, they are in love with green. And so if we impact their green, and I'm not talking about Celtic green, like Antoine 8, employee number 8. I'm not talking about that green. I'm talking about their money. If we're organized, and that's, and that's really what this is all about. As all of us have been in, in basketball, like the players or coaches, 
you don't go into a big game without a game plan. We have to have a game plan. And the game plan yeah. is that we now need to rally around. And that's why when I look at like the looting and all the other stuff, it allows white America to take their eyes off the real bribes and start talking about the looting and not about the murderer. You know, we need to be able to get it back. We need to get this this argument back to where we really need to be. Right. And if we do that, I think we have a legitimate chance to make some headway. I, I mean, it's just so much that's going on. Um, you know, 13 rings, by, by the time we solve it, it'll be like 450 rings, okay? Uh, <laughs> hey, Ty. Are these, oh, these problems are many. They're many. Hey, Ty. They're many. Yes, sir, so Nicholas. We got the platform right now, right? So therefore, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna we're gonna uh schedule our own rally and we're gonna get behind you and you're gonna go ahead and take us to the promised land, baby. And, and, the, one thing, and the one thing you can one thing you know, Nick, I don't have a problem with speaking out. I will no. go, I'll go if I have to go by myself. <laughs> I you, <laughs> and you know what? And hey Nick and Rob, and I'm gonna say this right now. We actually need to do something with our basketball players. We need to have a basketball player rally. We need to have that. Uh, those Because the majority of the players in our city are black and brown boys. And, and we cannot be fighting for that which impacts them, and we don't enjoy them into the fight. So when we get off of here, uh, uh, Larry, Rob, Nick, you kind of a, a coach, but not really a coach. You're a college guy now. Uh, we're gonna talk, we, we, we need to have a back-to-school we can call it a rally or a get together, whatever, where we bring all of our players together and we talk to them and they talk to us and they talk to the city and they talk to America because ultimately they're the ones that are being impacted by this more than us as older black men. So I, I know, think, I think, I think, I think what would be great. That's a great idea. Ty, so maybe you, you just call it like a town hall meeting. Yeah. yeah. Town hall meeting for the youth. I mean, Larry, I mean, I don't know how many people that we can get that really, that care and that, that have great insight on this, but just try to educate our young ball players. And that's just you guys putting our programs up. You get, I don't know, 10 schools. I don't know how, how y'all relationships are with other coaches that can get their players. Great, man, don't do us <laughs> like that. Huh? <laughs> no, great, uh, they great, but we got we to gotta, see in this thing right now, Twan, we got to, we got to, uh, we got the well, ace of think, spade on. We got the ace of spade on our side. Yes, sir. Nicholas, Nicholas can talk to everybody. That baby, I can talk to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the only, the go, only, the only, the only, the only coach, the only coach that I'm not really good with is the new coach at Kenwood. So maybe Nick can holler at him. <laughs> <laughs> hey, pick, pick, uh, hey, pick, uh, hey, pick, uh, hey, pick uh, one of you guys. Big gymnasium. Get all the players. You know you get social the distancing. Eight. Social distancing has to be outside. Has to be outside. Social has to distancing. Be outside, yeah. Social oh, okay. distancing. Okay. Yeah. Well, my, that's a, this, will, this will not be a Trump is, rally. Uh, no, no, it won't be a Trump rally inside. No, no, no my inside. Next no, question outside. is for Gordon. Okay. Gordon, listening to all of this and seeing what's going on. Don't be scared, uh, Gordon. We with you. Okay, we with you. We with you. So what? What? What is your take on on these things? What? What? Is, you know? What is your take? Not. Not what? Not. I don't. I know you as a what, person now. What do your uh, white friends say? What do I, your no, white no, I don't want to. I don't even want to know what his friends say. I want to know what he, how he feels. I, I want to know what they. You say. You know, one of my favorite things that I heard today was from Larry when you talked about the the erosion of the one on one relationship. To me, that is a huge path forward. I, I would love to hear more about that because that was news to me. You brought up the number, was it 18,000 to 13,000? Yeah, the oh, number took down. Yeah. That, that's a shocking number to me. So, like, I'm all about identifying, like, specific paths forward. That's a, a number. And I know that our city's population and, therefore, tax base is shrinking. So, I, get, I imagine that's part of it. I'm sure. That was a hey, – hey, Larry. Yeah. Larry, tell them when they come out with that new contract, that number's going to get even smaller. Oh, absolutely. Because hey, everybody's it gone. New, it don't yeah. take the new contract. It's going to be a, it's going to be a situation where if 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 the if this whole thing doesn't turn around, nobody's going to even want to be the police. They're going to have a hard time even keeping numbers sustainable to even run to even protect the city because nobody's going to. I mean, it's the most undesirable job you can imagine right now. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, saw something saying that this is – I saw something saying that they've had more people starting to think about retiring or retiring 
taking an early retirement, basically, versus, a, you know, when they was what they normally would be doing. They saying people are actually running out of the police department. Oh, absolutely. I, don't, yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I can see that. I don't want to live. In, I don't want to live in a city without police. I mean, and it, and I it's funny because uh, I don't even know how long he's been on the force. Mark Bradley. I just went to his retirement party about two less weeks. than me. Less. Than <laughs> <laughs> So he, uh, he just retired two weeks ago. I mean, well, he, he had a retirement party. I don't know if he's actually out or, or what the situation yeah, was. Yeah, I, 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 I think he left. Yeah. You know, and I, I didn't get a chance to talk to him on why. But And, yeah. and, and, then, and then I want to touch on also with, with Gordon. You know, Gordon is, is, is a great guy. Uh, we respect him. Uh, you know, I consider Gordon like a brother to me. Uh, you know, and me and him get along great. And Rob and Ty, since we've been doing the show, y'all got to know him and y'all getting to know him more and more. And I mean, we fine. You know, if, if more people look at it and see what we're doing and see the platform that we're building, we get along fine. We get along real good. And and one thing I appreciate about Gordon, he, he let us be ourselves. Uh, <laughs> then he, he, he give us good sound advice. And, you know, he, he for everybody. You know, he for all the people. And the platform, he, he, he helped help us build man that's 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 priceless and the I other just want to take to, to that. Go on gordon is like in our regular text messages when we talk it it ain't always just about the show no it's really not about the show <laughs> no. it's not always about the show sometimes we just start talking about other stuff so mm -hmm. i mean just like the police officers and I, i'm here to say it, they're not all bad you know and and i got a lot of friends who are white they ain't yeah, all bad. Absolutely. You know, I, I mean, I tell people all the time, I went to school in Casper, Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. And I went to Baylor, which is Waco. Wait, you went and to I, Baylor? Yeah, and then I finished up in Chickasha, Oklahoma. So, <laughs> Wait, how have we not talked about this? I, went, I started off college at Baylor. Didn't oh, my God. We're not about to have a reunion. We're not about to have a reunion. Oh, man. Not a reunion. I didn't know that. We definitely can't do that. talk about this. But, so, you know, I, I, I've been around. Now, where I grew up at was, was pretty much predominantly black. I was centered around Mexicans and white. My only interaction with them when I was growing up was making sure I could get from the bus stop to get home. But that was my <laughs> <laughs> I went to my whole high school was black. So when, I mean, it's not, that's not it. So I tell people all the time, like, even with the police, like you said, Larry, it's a small portion of them that's bad. Yeah. And yeah. And, I feel, and, and that's the same way with, with our race and other races. It, it's a small portion, but you, you can't say all of us are bad. Yeah, because I hit on that earlier, man, by saying to assume all police officers are, are bad is the same as, as it's as ignorant as assuming all black people are, are bad and all right. white people are racist. You know, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's not the case. Right. We have a own bad behavior. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and that's the problem. My mother used to always tell us that my mother wasn't an educated woman. She never went to college. And I don't even know if she finished high school, but she was smart. And she used to always tell us, you can't throw the baby out with the bath water. Okay. And when we start talking about getting rid of the police department, we're throwing the baby out with the bath water. What we need to do is get rid of the bad policemen. It's just like in basketball on your teams, you get rid of the bad player. You don't throw the whole team away because you got a bad player. <laughs> I mean, you don't do it. It's just like coaching. You got bad coaches, you get rid of bad coaches. Nobody ever advocates for getting rid of all the coaches because you got two bad coaches or whatever the number might be. And we have to get to that. But I, I think, you know, I think we as we go around the horn, we can we can talk about this for like all I said, that. another yeah. another two hundred rings. I am I, I'm just it, it, it's always like I told Antoine when he was on before. It was incredible to get the in, the the insight from him, a guy who had played at the very highest levels uh, of the game. Uh, and Melvin, I, I didn't have an opportunity to see Melvin play, but but based on Nick's um, description, <laughs> bad he, boy. Was, well, that Nick has told us he said he was a bad boy. He's a bad, bad boy. Uh, uh, played together. It was a win. Uh, uh, yeah. And, yeah. and now to, and today we have you know we have Larry. I know that Rob said. We wanted to get our three best guests, but they weren't available, so we took these guys. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> I turn it off. Uh, no, but I, I miss 
I missed Larry the last time because I was nervous. I thought they were going to get somebody else in and beat me. Larry didn't beat me. Uh, Mike beat me. So I could have come on that time. But um, <laughs> it, it, it was great. And like I said, it's just so many things that are going on in society. We look at, uh, we lost a couple great people today. That's why I want to get to Antoine and Melvin. Um, lost a phenomenal player today at a young age, at a young age. And um, uh, any thoughts on that, Antoine? Did you ever play with yeah, him? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Uncle Cliffy, yeah. We had some huge battles. Right. Um, my, my, my battles with Cliff were when he was with the Pistons. Um, right. and he was a part of their second unit. Um, there's probably some footage out there. I mean, we had some heated war words, and he was such a competitor. Um, and his game was similar to mine, so he was always a tough guard. He's one of the original – He's his name, because I guess he's not a big-name guy, but he's one of the original stretch fours. So if you know basketball, uh, and I know Melvin know this, this guy, he can put it on the floor, he can shoot the three, he can post up. He was a hell of a defender. Um, but it's unfortunate. 2020 has been a, a sad year for all of us in a lot of different ways, uh, especially for the African-American community. We're losing so many pillars in our community, people that have um, – has such impacts in our life. And I think about Kobe Bryant and now, you know, Cliff Robinson and then obviously the actor uh, last night too that passed away. So it's, just, it's tough. Um, I got a question for you. Did you hook Nick up with your PI person? He <laughs> <laughs> talk like you, man. <laughs> 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 Hey Rob, hey Rob, you got you got you got Nick going to coaching college. You got Mike Irvin coaching at Kenwood. <laughs> oh man, uh, hey, put your money. Hey, hey, uh, I wonder, hey Antoine, hey, I wonder, Antoine, Antoine. I, I'm looking up like I wonder what Mac thinking right now. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what Pop's thinking him, right man. now. I wonder what Pop's <laughs> thinking right now. Hey, Twan, I don't know if anybody saw, but I saw what was in your hand. I say go to the window right now because this world is changing. We have got everything. I mean, it's unbelievable. I, I, I'm going to look for one. I, I told Corey, I was going to tell Corey, one of the little boys are going to be coaching next. I mean, my God, they're going to be coaching at a grade school. I mean, every, every, every urban. But, but again, for me, and I've said this before, I am so happy now that Mike is coaching because there's going to be a battle. I don't know what that battle is going to look like. I can't wait to read the papers when uh, Kenwood plays uh, Simeon. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. <laughs> well, one, thing, one thing I know about Mike, he's a little bit more laid back than Nick. He ain't, he yeah, ain't, he is. He ain't going to be pushing for it. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no, no. hey. Did you read? Did you read his article the other day? I thought I thought oh, Nick I didn't was see writing it. those. Oh come on! I thought Nick was writing that line. I said, "Oh boy, hey, Nick ain't he, gone. He's still there." Hey, he sent me. <laughs> Mike sent me an article this morning, Ty. I ain't read it yet. This must be the oh, article you're talking about. Oh, it's yeah, I ain't seen it yet. Look, I knew he it was the article. Sent it to me too. I gotta I, read it. I, I, I knew it was the article. I, I knew Nick wrote it. I know Mike didn't say this because he said something about they're going to be putting Nick's name on the floor. I said, wow, that's unbelievable because I know they don't have any space on the wall because every player that ever played for Nick, their numbers retire. So they can't put it on the wall. They're going to they put his name on the floor. Including Marcus Liberty, who didn't play for him. Now, Ty, you see yes, my background. It got four rings holding up. Oh, my, my name should have oh, gone on the floor. Uh, um, I, I know it's going to go on the floor. I know. It's it better go on Kenwood. the floor. They're going to put it on the floor at Kenwood. They're going to put it on the floor at Kenwood. Hey, hey, it better go on somebody's floor because at the end of the day, if it don't go on that floor, I ain't never going back over there. Oh, you'll go back. You'll go back. You'll go back. <laughs> hey, I've got a question for Melvin. Can I ask Melvin a question? You, yeah, you can play show. <laughs> You it's play. your show, buddy. It's the, your show. It's not my show. Stop. We've hijacked the 13. First rings. of all, oh you guys don't know this. Melvin and I have a, a mutual friend. One of my best friends in the world lives out in LA and does uh, basically like experiences for different ministry opportunities with the military and stuff. And Melvin was on one of those military trips. So you talk about somebody who understands. I know Melvin said the fewest words on this call. But I know for a fact that he cares about that kind of one-on-one -on -one relationship building that Larry was talking about. So you've done it. Can you tell us a little bit about that that military experience that you had? Uh, we uh, we ended up uh, going, and uh, it ended up getting passed through by Trump. So I got to give him kudos for that, at least that. But uh, <laughs> it was us, um, another uh, me, Keon Doolin, um, um, uh, actor. Um, yeah. Uh, 
uh, and we all just went down to support the troops. Um, people get kind of confused because when they say the, the troops, you already think of the president and, and, and you hate the president, so you hate the troops. And they're two totally different things. Our, our troops are here to protect us from our president. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they, 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 they protect us um, and, and, you know, at cost of their families. And it's a real high suicide rate over there. So we went over there to talk to them and uh, just to let them know that they are loved. Um, and you, you have Man, to get- I'm in the basement. Uh, because when we, when we got there, it was, uh, we saw one of the, uh, the, the, the admirals or so, whoever you say yes, sir, to. I know everybody just kept calling him sir. <laughs> and he was all wet. Like, his, the front of his clothes was all wet. And, you know, he wanted to disclose something to us. So we were like, yeah, you know, what just happened? He had just left from saving somebody's life because they filled up a water tank, uh, one of them, uh, the ones they catch rain in. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they, they set the, the troops drinks in there. So one of the guys tied his arms around his back and sat in it while it was full of water. Wow. Barely saved the guy's life. And, mm. you know, he, he told us that, you know, they, they think that everybody hates them. They think that they're alone. And we made sure to get the message across uh, that they were loved coming back home from every aspect, mm. from sports, from TV entertainment, because our freedoms that we have, they are, they, they're, they're not the freedom that give, that the president give. They're, they're the ones that the military earned for us. You know, everything that we do is because of them. And they really think, most of them think that we hate them. Uh, but we just yeah. had to go make sure and just to let them know that they are loved. Um, anything for the military, anything from homeless to, to kids, uh, any organization that ever wants my time has it. Uh, my, I spent my whole career uh, chasing my dream. And, uh, you know, like I told uh, my, my oldest son, my time now is to help people chase theirs. You know, be it my kids, uh, a military kid that just, just needs a head up. Um, I'm a pen pal to about 20 of them that's still over there. Wow. Uh, we ended up uh, uh, going to seven military bases. Um, when, we, when we had spoke to them, you could see people tearing. And uh, I'm not trying to get, you know, emotional, but these people that they give up, they give up the ultimate sacrifice. They give up their time, you know, and we all know time is short. And you don't know how old you really are until that, end, you know, until that <laughs> that dial ends and, you know, and they, they feel like you forgot about them. So we went over there to help um, and just to show our support. And it was the, and it was the greatest thing I ever did in my life. So Melvin, ever, what did, did, did y'all, what did y'all go to? Uh, we went to Poland. So okay. uh, we occupied Poland to keep uh, the Russia off their ass. <laughs> <Here's>, <laughs> the your there. official military like, analysis. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> We went there, um, they told us just that, they, they gave us the big tour. And with all of them, you can see these kids missing home, missing loved ones, and they're doing it for us and we hate them. Or the picture that they perceive is that we hate them. So if you can, you know, you know, and people always go, you know, uh, thank you for your sacrifice, you know, and people forget about time, which is the biggest sacrifice. So when you see one, thank them for your, their sacrifice and their time that they're given. Because life is something you can't get back, and that's exactly what they, they give for our freedoms. And it's funny. You know, I do it all the time. You said that. Me and Ty was talking about um, probably about a week ago, a week or two ago, and we were talking about um, me and myself with my kids going to play basketball right now. And um, my daughter is really, really into it. And I mean, my son is too, and my daughter's going to high school and is really into it. And he said something to me that was, that was you know, Crucial. That just let me know that you know our friendship is you know true. He said only thing he regrets is that he didn't give his daughter enough time when she was playing because he was doing everything that he was doing, yep. you know? and she was playing at that same time. But he he didn't give her that time, and he said that he he overheard her telling her mom that he helped all these other guys and went to spend time with them but he didn't spend the time with me. And that, that, that's crucial because Nick, you know, and yeah. Melvin, you know, as a, as a player, Antoine, you, you're gone from your family. I mean, you guys, well, we're, we're gone. We spent so much time on the road playing games and here and doing that, that we forget about, you know, them, because we're trying to make sure that they're okay. But yeah. with that time, like you said, Melvin, we, we lose that time. 
And that's something you can't bring back. And that's something he was telling me, like, if he can do anything over, that's what he would do over, would be able to give her that time or at least some of that time and, and try to do some things different that he would be able to spend that time with her. Yeah, because the one thing people always do, they'll look at me, they'll look at Twan, they'll look at all these basketball players, and they'll, they'll tell you to shut up and dribble and all that. And they don't treat you like human. Um, you, you know, the season's six and a half months long. Um, with, with training, you probably around nine to ten months with two months to, to allocate the family, but you're still training. And my oldest son had told me um, not too long ago, because we all going to get faced with this truth uh, from your kids, because they will tell you the truth. And my mm. kid had told me that he would rather have the time with me than any Xbox, any Jordan shoe mm. that could have ever mm. bought. Wow. And as a father, that was a kick between the legs because, you know, I did this for them. But, you know, he would rather have the, the me. And it wasn't until I got away from basketball and, uh, and um, actually focused in on my life and my family that I really found out where I was playing. And when you pick that out, everything goes easy. But um, I do have I do have something I want to address to Juan. I've been meaning to get this out to you because everybody oh, gives right. their roses, um, you know, when they pass away. And I want to get my roses out as fast as I can because, you know, time is, is fast, especially with Cliffy passing. And Twan, you were one of the, the, the highlights of my, my whole career. Um, when I first got to the league, you were the first person to make me feel accepted. Um, I don't know if you remember this, but we were at a gym. And the guy wouldn't let me play. I don't want to give this guy power, so I'm not going to say his name. And he wasn't going to let me play. And it wasn't until you told him, hey, man, what the hell are you doing? He's one of us. And I know you remember that day because I put my head <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't even supposed to be on that court because Mike was on that court too. So I, I, I was at that court, but to make me feel sorry, sorry, like I was a brother life. to you, and, and and to make me feel like I belong in the NBA was something that everybody everybody looks for. But to get it from you and to always <laughs> get it from you, brother, and God bless your soul, brother, because it, it helped me. My career to have someone I knew was in my corner because every time I saw you, bro, it was like the first time again. Like you didn't care if we didn't speak for a year. Hey, how you doing? How's basketball? You know, how's the fam? You know, and, and it was always the same with you, man. And I cannot say that about every NBA brother because I have a lot of friends, but I don't have many people I look up to you, brother. And I, and I, from my family to yours, bro, you are always in our prayers. And I wish you the best because you were a blessing to me. Hey, Cindy. Man, hey, I appreciate hey, that. Hey, <laughs> Great stuff. Uh, man, I appreciate that, man. I mean, I got in the Uber, no fella, so I got... No, well, I, got, I got in the well, Uber, so I got yeah, I'm well, getting the Uber. Melvin, I don't know if you... Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you uh, heard any of our podcasts, but Nick already said that about you, brother. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know if you heard any of our podcasts, but he... I mean, of course, I don't, I don't know you like that. I, I've seen you from afar, but just your name. I mean, episodes we didn't had, uh, Gordon. What I think this is. is I think this is sixteen. 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 Nick then brought you up thirteen times out of the sixteen. <laughs> yes, sir. I, 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 you up. Hold hold he on. wasn't on the show. <laughs> but, the only, but the only thing, now, Ron, you got to be honest. He may have bought him up 13 times, but he didn't tell us he didn't pass the ball to the bank. He never said that. Now, wait. He never said that, though. Uh, Melvin, I want one story about Chris Paul because you played with him, and he's at the center of the sports universe right now, leading the Players Association. And then I want one story about Nick Irvin, too. Oh, uh, so <laughs> I, got, I got a great one for Chris. So we're uh, – we're take – we're, we're – I think it's game four. We're, we're in the middle of playing the Spurs for the Western Conference Championship. And um, Tyson gets – he's down. He has a, a hurt ankle. And I'm going through all these plays with Coach Scott. And, you know, first thing out of Coach Scott's mouth was, man, look, we have to run these plays. Chris is going to hit his hip. Do not go run the play. I'm like, okay. I'm not really, you know – normally when I'm in, Chris is out. So, you know, the rotates out. We do it a few – few reps together, but more than likely, I'm setting the pick and roll. I'm diving. So, he's yelling out horns. I'm getting in. It's the third quarter. He's yelling horns. Chris hits his hip. 
I stay put. Chris called a timeout. Like, not the coach. Chris called a timeout. We <laughs> huddle up. Um, coach asked him what the timeout was. He was like, man, we got to get Mel going. Coach looks over, give me a wink, right? Like, yeah, thank you for doing what I asked. So we're going out. Uh, this is my first year on a two-year contract. So we're walking out uh, to the court, and uh, Chris hits me on the ass, and he goes, you're going to listen to coach, or you're going to listen to the person that's going to give you the ball. <laughs> <laughs> I Chris, the next three plays, I hit my hip. He hit his hip. I ran up to the screen, dive down. Coach yelled out, uh, twist, which is another Put the second ball. address in, too, sir. He, um, he hits his hip again. I run my butt up there. Um, I do. I roll. The coach call a timeout. Not for the whole team, just for me. Team sits down. He stands up. He goes, hey, Mel, so Chris gave you the talk, right? I go, what talk you mean? He threatened you with the ball, huh? I go, yeah. He goes, well, do you want the ball or do you want time? So I look at coach. I'm, I'm, I'm screwed without either. So what you want me to do? So I end up huh? getting beat for like the rest of the, rest of the time. I am. Left. I'm talking to you. That, that, that was something else. Um, you know, Chris was a great point guard. He was a, a floor general, and when he said do something, you did it, or you weren't getting that ball. So, I, and I love his his his, uh, his energy. But for for Nick, the best one it was the one I told you guys um, before we even started. Nick was uh, I forgot what game it was, and I had just hit eight eight almost eight shots in a row. I'm getting fouled. Nick is like pushing me into people, telling me to get hyped. I'm like, yeah, and this is before halftime. I'm like, man, I'm about to get a dub before half. I'm, I don't have eight shots in a row. It's like five minutes on the clock. So come down, me and Nick, you know, we do, we do a, a – we set a screen and then we re-screen. Normally he throw, throw the lob, he shoots the jumper, right? <laughs> I, Nick, I, I, I get the rebound. I tip it out to Nick. I go back up, set the pick. This time I post. Nick shoots the ball. Didn't even care. Just shot it. So I'm like, okay. You know, Nick shot the ball twice. Not going to happen again. Come down a third time. <laughs> Coach Clark is deliberately telling him to get me the ball. Yeah. He comes up and hash shoots it. Now, anybody know Nick Nick shooting and hash is not a big thing. No. So Nick shoots it. I go, Nick, what's up, man? You can't give me the ball, man. You, you, you know, I'm eight for eight. And then he just switches everything on me. He goes, man, look, what about the rebounds, big fella? What about <laughs> double, double. How many blocks you got? <laughs> I'm looking at Nick like, dude, I'm in here talking to you about the ball, and now my block shots and rebounds come up. And then you go, why you at it? Stop letting number 35 bust your ass, man. <laughs> I forgot about getting the ball. I just went ahead, and then they got a triple double at the end of the game. I'm like, well, I guess I got to rebound the block shots. Nick ain't gonna get hey, you got re hey, you had to rebound block right. shots. I'm like, man, I ain't gonna keep Jay. Yeah, Talk that. Talk yeah, no, we Nick, going to he, when right. Nick, We're going where? We Nick was like like his dad. He, he, you know, me and Nick went to the same college. I played for his dad at AAU, and Nick was a coach on the floor. Um, he would make you do things that you didn't know you can do. He would get the best out of you. I swear he got that from the pop. So yeah, but no, we're going to May first. Being a coach and, and, and keep elevating, like, the sky's the limit for Nick because Nick uh, definitely got it from his father. But that's the best. <laughs> if Appreciate you ever wanted the ball from Nick, I, I promise you, you got to get some rebounds and block some shots. <laughs> uh, yeah. Can you guys hear me with my mask on? Yeah, you're great. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I got to, before y'all get kick me off, I got to say this to Mel. Mel, I appreciate the crowd words, brother. Um, I always look at it as, you know, obviously you from Chicago. I got to know you really, really well. Um, your brother is like my, you know, my brother is Nick, and Nick, I know how much Nick loves you, and I'm very close to Nick just as well, as much as you are, so I know how highly he speaks to you. Um, he was a driving force in my head, and how good you're going to be, how great you're going to be when you was on your way to the league, so you got a real friend and a brother in Nick that, that always cares about you. I want to definitely um, let you know that, but for me as a player, man, just, I'm, I'm from Chicago, bro. I just felt like you family. I know as we get older and we separate and everybody moves to different parts, but um, you guys have always been good to me. You and a host of other guys. 
anytime I ask you guys to join me for camps or charity events and stuff like that, that's, that, that stuff means the world to me. But I remember that time you talking about, that's Tim Grover, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> you talking about, you talking about Tim yeah. Grover. I, I didn't want to say it, though, because... Uh, I already know you talking about Tim Grover. And, and it's, it's crazy you say that, but that's probably the reason why Tim Grover did not continue because he didn't, he didn't respect the guys that, you know, if you wasn't a big name guy, he didn't respect you the way you needed to. And he ended up losing the line clientele. That's a whole nother story. But I remember that story. I want to let you know, I do remember that. And I know that was a Tim Grover story. I used to have to fight with Tim every day about who was the real good players in the league. And he did you know, if it wasn't Michael Jordan, Michael Finley, Jawan Howard, he really didn't know. So you just had to remind him that these guys are going to be the next guys that's going to carry the torch for us. So, Brother, let's continue with your success, man, because like you said, we don't get to talk to each other a lot. And, you know, there's so many great pros, and I always reminisce about the old times and guys that supported me. I know Chicago's down for basketball right now. That's why I want to push Rob and those guys to continue to do things for the, for the guys to keep, keep this torch going. But, man, brother, you're a big success in this city. A lot of people don't know that. You're one of the pillars that, that made things special here. So don't never forget that, you know, guys that know the game, know how good you were and know what's the impact that you made for Chicago basketball. But I appreciate the kind words, brother. I, I really do. You don't get to hear that all the time. So it definitely hit home, man. So I really appreciate that. Hey, guys, you got me in this Uber. Y'all got me hanging in there because this conversation's so good. But, y'all, but like I told y'all, y'all ain't going to sa- y- ruin my Saturday all the time, man. Y'all know I got to go me a few. Hey, Yo. Juan, I told them, I said it before we did. I said, man, let's go at 11. And they didn't even know why I said 11, because I said about 2 <laughs> o'clock, I know this bad boy here. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, hey, too. Ain't no hey, way Rob. y'all keep him in the house. Hey, Rob, yeah. the game, we got a triple header today, baby. I got to go set up, baby. We got three games today. Yes, sir. It's, it's three it. games today. I got to go watch some games, baby. Have but, me a few uh, drinks. Hey, wrap up. Uh, as always, man, it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you guys on here. Um, I mean, I, we, we, we came. This is why we put this together. This Actually, this is going to be our last show for a little while. We're going to take a little break. We don't want to, you know, water it down. We have to get back and regroup and find some, you know, different group of people to put on and do stuff like this. So our weekends are now going to be open for us, but we want to make sure we did our last one to be, you know, the best one. So I'm sure that we'll get a lot of views with this one, especially with the guys that we have on here and the topics that we talked about. Of course, we didn't get into much basketball like we normally do, which is fine for what's going on right now. Um, that's more important than basketball at this point. And I'm, I mean, just a conversation, we understand that. We, we can always sit around and talk about basketball with each other on different times. But to talk about this topic was huge for us today. So, again, thank you guys. Uh, Gordon, once again, thank you and Nick for putting this whole thing together. Um, it, it's been a blast. You know, I know the guest that's been on always come back and say thank you guys for even having us on now. Um, so we got about a month or so before we get back together. Um, Ty, mm-hmm. when is your press conference? I want to make sure. <laughs> well, I, I got to say this. I got about five more questions about Antoine's uh, taekwondo, tennis. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this man plays every single sport, and we only hear this much about his life. We don't know about these secret things. <laughs> the next time we, we have Antoine, I'm going to ask him about that. I got about 10 more questions for Melvin about, you know, <laughs> he played with Tim Duncan and David Robinson. I'm sure he's got a lot of great stories about that. And uh, we didn't even touch on your Thornton days, too. So, but, but today, no, but my, was, my, um, I think that we're the greatest person here. I just want to say thank you for taking yes. our tough questions. And you are, it, it, you're just a man of pure class, icon at Roosevelt and you didn't have to sit here and listen to our us complain about the world, and you know, okay. and you just handled all of that, those tough questions with with nothing but love and and pure class. So I just want to say thank you for for taking what we had to to what you had to put up with today. Yeah, Gordon, and let me, let me say before we close, um, uh, Melvin, I, I tell you your stories about what you're doing with the uh, military. That was that was pretty powerful, and then Rob to follow up with my own piece, it, it just kind of reav- it, it reaffirmed what, what I actually believe in. And, and I appreciate what you do for the military because the, the chief of the military is a coward and he didn't go to the military and we don't hate the military, but some of us do dislike him. Uh, Antoine, always love having him, always love having him. Uh, Larry, like uh, Gordon said, you are a class act. 
you are a bad dresser, but a class actor. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and be safe. Hey, uh, Nick, uh, good luck to you and what, what's about to happen with you guys down there. And Rob, I'll be talking to you, who knows, in about an hour or so. So, uh, Gordon, uh, you are uh, Nick's brother. You have more hair than he does. And, and obviously, <laughs> your, your, your genes are better. This has, for me, really, this has been a coronavirus a filler. And uh, uh, the time that I've been on here, this has been really as fun as my week has been. And I have, um, I really enjoyed it. And, and I've enjoyed you. And, and, and like Rob said, and like Nick has said, for making this platform available to us, to make it available to us. And my like pleasure. today, Rob took over. He became the 13 Rings uh, host. And, and so we just appreciate you allowing us to have an opportunity to to talk about some real pressing issues, not just a bunch of BS, uh, but some pressing issues. So for that, I thank you. And uh, hey, I'm signing out. Signing out. Yeah. No, I appreciate y'all too, man. And you know, we we started off uh, thinking we got, wasn't gonna do one, but we ended up at 16, and it's more to come. And I just want to say thank y'all uh, helping me put this together because when that without y'all wouldn't be possible. And 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 everybody was saying that how can them three start a, a podcast together? How them three can do this together? But they don't know it's bigger than basketball, and it, it's about the life of, of, of every uh, human being out here. And that's one thing that we, we care about, and love about. So, I uh, man, I appreciate y'all and and, yeah. and 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 Mel and and uh, and uh, A Dub, nice. man. You know I love y'all to death. And Larry, you know, man, man, you my man, you my man. Love you, Larry. And, Man, we're going to keep th keep this thing rolling. I'm going to get y'all a shirt, man. Y'all need hey, one. I, yeah, give me one. Give me one. I'm a size, I'm a size large. And, I, I and, want, every, and, every, and everybody I knows it. Not everybody, a crime, baby. And if everybody knows it, uh, <laughs> Nick always goes last because we know he won't pass if we give it to him first. He won't pass. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I want to thank you guys for having me on the show too, man. I started to get a little offended when I used to see this, and when I was watching the show on Facebook. That, <laughs> that, I'm off the butt in, but Ask hey, Nick, I've been have... pushing for you since day one. I've been pushing for you and anybody hey, from Gordon to come hey, up. Hey, go, hey, Gordon, you ought to get mail on your show. You ought to get mail on on, on the uh, one you do with your network. I, I would love that. I'm, uh, mail. Hey. So Man, as soon as I get off here, I'm finna hit Trey Webb and tell him I was on the podcast with the best player that ever played at that. <laughs> All right. All right. And I got the stats to prove it. Hey, oh, you know, oh. if you guys got any players, brother, out south, yep. especially swing, you know, shooting bigs and things like that, send them to me, brother. Every I don't, big uh, is a shooter, Mel. Every, every, no, every big no, is no, a shooter. No, no. See, I had, learn, shooter now. I, I had to learn to shoot, but I can damn sure teach that hook and post moves like that. That's going to get it. I, and I had to learn the shooting stuff. But it, it, it's good to do. What, what's a hook and a post move? What are those? What are those? <laughs> oh, my God. I, 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 what, what's, a, what, what's a hook and a post move? People do that? People post oh, yeah, up? Yeah. Oh, hey. my God. Uh, hey. I, I'm with you. You, you, you preach it to the choir. But I'm just saying, there's, not, there's not a kid that wants to go in the post. Yeah, but you got to teach it all, man. So, I, you know, I, the three I, years I've been in coaching was a, was a blessing in a few years that I, I've had uh, up under some NBA coaches were a huge blessing because I had to get out of my own skin. I had to basically, you know, learn everything instead of just knowing my position. And that's one thing in coaching that I didn't didn't realize. And I also didn't realize why coaches curse. Coaches curse because you spend all night cutting film, getting the game plan together, getting the coaching plan together, and for none of your kids to listen when it comes to games. So. <laughs> so I figured that out. I did, and uh, you know, I, I and and you know, it's funny. Right when I learned how to coach, well, I got the somewhat hang of it, and I knew I would like it. I literally called all my coaches and apologized. Coach Hart, <laughs> Coach Hill, I apologized to all of them because I was that kid. You know, I was that didn't listen. You know, I was likable but didn't listen, and I, I know I gave my coach an ulcer every now and again. So, you know, you got <laughs> any players, man. I. I don't like what people are doing to these kids. They charging fifty bucks to even get in the gym. That's not basketball, man. It, basketball should be ping taught. pong ball with a cup of water on their head underneath the table. Well, yeah, we talked about like, that too. Yeah, basketball <laughs> comes with a heart, and, and it should be taught by people that love the game. And 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 when, when you get away from that, you start having people abuse the game, which waters it down. So I'm happy to be talking to a bunch of people that I know love the game. So if you got any players that, that you know that can 
need a little coaching up that, you know, can't find a gym or don't have that $50 to get the gym, send this butt my way. I'll get them in the gym. So, yes, sir.